universities have traditionally been places of enlightenment. And the question is, you know, should we aim to control them or should we just let it happen? And so let's see what science says about it. So we are living in a time of big data. In just one minute, we are generating 700,000 Google queries, 500,000 Facebook posts. As we go shopping, as we move, that creates data and taking together big data. And we can do a lot of things with that. And in fact, that has fueled a dream Chris Anderson has formulated is that if we just had enough data, we wouldn't need theory any longer. The truth would just reveal itself from the data. And we would just have to do what the data tells us. Can we now know everything with all the data that's becoming available? Can we build a crystal ball even that allows us to see what happens in the world at any time, in any place, or even predict the future? And in fact, there are militaries around the world that are building such kinds of machines, and also research institutions, and that has created this question of, with so much information, enable a better modern indicator. Would we just have to do what the data tells us to do? Can we now optimize the role? And is democracy in our data technology? Some people have said, um, in fact, it has created a lot of wealth, health, and happiness for billions of people all over the world, but now we want to do something new. Could society be run like a giant machine. If we wanted to do that, then we would need to know what are all the different pieces making up society and how these different pieces interact with each other and how they can be manipulated or controlled. And in fact, this is what companies around the world are working on. IBM, for example, has suggested uh, that IBM's Watson cognitive computer should run for president. Well, given the candidate and <laughs> the warlike election, well, one could certainly debate about this, but uh, the question is, is that technology ready to go? And what about Google? Google wants to reprogram the state. This is about creating an operating system for our society, not just for computers and smartphones. And Facebook has imperial ambitions too. So these are the kinds of questions that I'm addressing in my recent book, The Automation of Society is Next, after the automation of fabrication and the creation of self-driving cars. It's now happening that we try to automate society. The question is, is it good or bad, and how does it work? Well, it works using machine learning, such as deep learning algorithms, and these algorithms run on our data, data that has been collected about each and every one of us, mostly without knowing, mostly without our agreement, but these data exist, we know that since Edward Snowden. And these algorithms try to learn what we do and how our behavior can be influenced with personalized information. That's the business model of Google, in fact. So they're sending personalized information to us in order to guide our attention, our decision making, our opinions, our behavior. We should buy certain kinds of products, of course. And that makes us controlled to some extent. Are we remotely controlled? If we look at pictures like this, you know, one could get the impression that this is already the case, uh, certainly only to some extent. And the question is, is it good or bad? It makes our society more predictable, right? But are we more innovative? Are we better in addressing the challenges? <laughs> So, yes, it seems like there is the possibility of controlling people, and it's happening in a way that we would not even notice before, that personalized information would be tailored to us to such an extent that we would not even notice that we have been manipulated. I think this is a very dangerous development. We are about to lose our freedom of decision making, and this is not only concerning for ethical reasons. In fact, those people who have come up with this proposal to manipulate people's behavior with 
start to get concerned. But besides those ethical issues that maybe we shouldn't do it, because it's not the nature of humans you know, to be controlled, um, it's not working very well. Right? It's not working well enough, so the intention is somehow that with this kind of magic or big matching, magic combined with big data, we should become healthy people who take care of the environment and are friendly to others and all this, but it doesn't work so well. And it's partly because it's not so easy to find out how to control people. There are a lot of patterns in big data, but many of these patterns are meaningless, there are spurious correlations that would be misleading, such as this one. Number of zero killers as a function Switzerland, you know, and we would better lock away everyone who loves eating chocolate. But in fact, you know, finding a really powerful causal relationship is as difficult as finding a vein of gold. And there's some luck involved in this effect. <coughs> now there's another thing that we need to care about. The filter bubble that's being created as personalized information is created and a personalized Gold is built up by Google and, and Facebook and other companies because it's basically creating a box around us. It's very difficult to escape this box, but we have to do that if we want to be creative and innovative, if, you, if you want to come up with solutions that are really different from the solutions that we know. Besides that, yeah, there's now this discussion that Facebook might be manipulating our thinking, and that makes us vulnerable actually to misleading information. In fact, there's already some hybrid warfare going on based on this principle. So you know, Facebook is being used as a weapon to some extent. Uh, it's known, I know, that uh, it creates a radicalization, so some of the extremism we see in past years might be related to those filter bubbles forget uh, to understand other people um, because we're just confronted with the kinds of ideas that we like and we don't have enough experience anymore to really interact with people with other points of view so we're even entering now a factory world and Barack Obama himself has warned us about it he said this is also a time around the world when some of the fundamental ideals of liberal democracies are under attack and when notions of objectivity and of a free press and of facts and of evidence are trying to be undermined or in some cases ignored entirely. And in fact now artificial intelligence is being used not only for good things but also to influence our opinion, public opinion. Social bots are quite powerful played a role also in the Brexit vote, and it might explain, explain why there was quite some regret after that vote. And many other people were puzzled, how could it happen, you know, have people gone crazy, can we allow them to vote in the future, and so on, and the markets have gone crazy too. It was actually a very expensive experience, three trillion dollars were lost in just one day. So this kind of technology has not only ethical implications, individual implications for our freedom, for our, our innovation capacity, and for our society, but also for our economy. And in fact, if we look into data, it doesn't seem that those countries that uh, seem to be inspired by <coughs> based on big data are doing better than other countries. In fact, we can say altogether since a couple of years the world economy hasn't been done very well. So somehow the success principles of the past aren't working any longer. That is optimization, globalization, administration, regulation that served us well but now they come to a limit somehow. 
And the solution is called mechanism design. Changing the interaction between the components, in this case, the cars, will change the outcome of this optimization that happens in that system. Uh, what we're seeing at the moment is a simulation of this terrible stop and go traffic that we're suffering from every day. This is demonstrating you that we understand the process, that we have mathematical formulas that can be simulated in the computer. Now, what we'll do is, after elevating ourselves to see the reason for the problem, which is that there is an on-ramp and, and some cars are trying to get on the freeway, which creates small disruptions, which are amplified and causes some more traffic. Well, now equip those cars <coughs> with radar sensors that measure the distances and relative velocities and use this information to drive those cars automatically now. And will slightly change the interactions in such a way that the traffic flow is stabilized and the capacity is slightly increased. As you can see, we get rid of the traffic jam. Without the traffic control center, in a decentralized way, by just changing the interactions between those cars, we can do that by introducing the right kind of feedbacks in the system. Somehow this is frozen. change the interactions. And then basically you get the desired outcome like magic. just frozen, so I need to restart my computer. Anyway, so the, the point is the interaction between the components of a complex system determine the outcomes through self organization. Changing the interaction will result in a different outcome. And in many cases, we can find interactions that would create a desirable outcome by itself like magic. And this is the beauty about complexity science. So this is a way how we can create desirable outcomes in some degree of control in a world that is complex and is not controllable from above. Okay. And we have applied the same principle actually to urban traffic where we have less traffic flows control the traffic lights rather than the other way around. And the traffic lights in this way were flexibly responding to the traffic situation. And you can see that has improved the performance dramatically for the entire traffic situation. 
and in particular, it does also improve the environmental conditions a lot. And these kind of decentralized approaches are now becoming more and more favorable also in electricity grids and in production where we talk about industry 4.0. Now, interestingly enough, the same approach can also be applied to society. We can create digital assistance to support decision making. And the important point here is we wouldn't be told from a centralized supercomputer what we have to do. We would turn these devices on and off. We would choose the goal. Then we would get a number of options offered. And we would choose. And then we would be supported to achieve our goal. Now, I think it's important to realize that we're just about to see a transformation of our society, a fundamental transformation. And this transformation is a result of economic necessity. So we've seen that actually in the past, the more complex an economy becomes, the more freedom is needed in order to be able to turn this complexity into an advantage. Now there are actually three kinds of transformation that are going on at the same time that we have to master in parallel. One is the digital transformation, which is driven by automation and unemployment. The other is the ecological transformation towards a sustainable economy that wouldn't use oil, gas, and coal any longer. And the third transformation is actually a transformation of the financial system, because obviously it's not working very well for most of the people. So we need to reinvent our economy for this. And I think it can be done in such a way that it would be efficient, liberal, participatory, social, and ecological at the same time. Of course, we have new technology that enables this. We now need to build this post-carbon economy. Otherwise, we'll be in trouble course of climate change, dying of many species on this earth, and we will not have enough food for ourselves. In order not to run into resource shortages that are impending in fact, we'll have to reuse resources. We need to urgently build a circular economy and a sharing economy so with the same amount of resources we could create a high quality of life for many more people. But so far, we haven't made much progress. But that can change. We are now working on a project called NerdsNet, and it's building a citizen web using Internet of Things technology. In fact, technology that you're all using, your smartphone. Your smartphone contains many sensors. These can be used to measure the environment around us. And we can, in fact, connect our smartphones with each other in such a way that we would uh, build a global measurement system together that the citizens would run. And in this way, we could measure what economists call externalities, things like noise, emissions, uh, waste, unemployment, but also desirable things such as cooperation, happiness, reuse of resources, and so on. So we could give all those externalities a price or a value. And in this way, we could create a multidimensional incentive system. We introduce feedback loops in the system in such a way that there would be incentives to uh, reuse resources. So it would really boost a circular economy and a sharing economy. And we build it right. And it's important that this would be a multidimensional incentive system. Now, the interesting point is, this cannot be built. Bitcoin has shown it. The technology is there. Now, we also need a new way of governing our complex systems, because they're too complex for anybody to understand them fully, even for supercomputers, even for artificially intelligent systems. I mean, we need to build collective intelligence by bringing the best ideas of many brilliant minds together. And for this, we need online deliberation platforms where we can put all our knowledge and ideas on a virtual table where we can organize these arguments into different perspectives and then 
we can try to integrate those different perspectives to get better solutions than any individual solution. Because the success principle of collective intelligence is that by combining several solutions, we'll often get a much better result than even the very best individual solution creates. So diversity wins, not the best. Uh, this is really amazing, and I advise you to look up uh, Wikipedia at uh, keyword Netflix Prize. In fact, bees and other social animals are using this strategy. So they're being sent out randomly to explore uh, the environment for food sources, and then they're returning with information that's being integrated. The green doesn't tell them what to do. It's really a collective process. And in fact, you know, my interpretation of the politics of Angela Merkel is that she's somehow often applying this principle, that she's waiting to, for information to come in and uh, for it to equilibrate, and then she's basically announcing the result. And if she's not doing this, taking her own decisions, then sometimes it's not working so well. So, she, she is already applying, I believe, in many cases, a collective intelligence principle, but we could um, empower it further by digital means. So the important point is that the future will not be optimized by telling everyone what to do, like uh, putting this bird in that place and telling everyone this is what we expect you to do, but by enabling everyone to make better decisions, and the success principles, in other words, is combinatorial innovation. So we need to create frameworks that are suitable for many people to perform well, and that requires value pluralism, and it requires freedom, because we know that freedom is actually creating, uh, promoting creativity and innovation. And we also know that the most complex and diverse economies are the most successful. So what we really need to do is to build an information innovation, production and service ecosystem where everyone can contribute and everyone can benefit. And the nice thing about it is really the digital economy is unlimited in its potential. So everyone can benefit. There are opportunities for all even for those who just get excited about Pokemon Go and other games, because we'll use eventually these gaming platforms to try out new ways of governance, new financial systems, new decision-making principles that would later on be implemented in our society. So, concluding, it's a combination of smart technology with smart citizens that creates smarter societies, and it's now time to act, because the science industry for the O, we need finance for the O, economy for the O, governance for the O. We now have the science, we have the technology, and we just have 15 years to do this, so it takes now powerful visionary people to create this framework for the society for the O.